Okay. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Paul Dillon. I'm the current chair of the Mechanical and Manufacturing Division here in Engineers Ireland. And uh, I also serve as the chair for the Republic of Ireland branch of uh, IMECE, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers here in Ireland. Um, I'd like to welcome you to here to Engineers Ireland and especially to this Mechanical and Manufacturing Division's keynote address to be given by uh, Professor Jerry Byrne. Um, a welcome also to those people who are online. Uh, apologies, um, currently there's no means of asking questions online, but that has been addressed by engineers and will be sorted out in the near future. Um, but hopefully the discussion at the end that we'll have hopefully might answer some of your questions. Um, some small housekeeping duties. Um, there's an exit at the back there and an exit over here on the left, just in case there's any disturbance. Um, We'll keep questions at the end, and uh, there'll be a microphone to go around, uh, so somebody will be circulating in the room, so you can then ask um, uh, the questions via the microphone. Um, Professor Byrne has given consent to actually webcast this event, and this webcast will be available in, online in uh, a few weeks' time on the Engineers Ireland YouTube channel. Um, this particular division of Engineers Ireland Mechanical and Manufacturing Division uh, it seeks to provide opportunities for the development of the profession through networking opportunities for um, the members through technical lectures on any uh, topics such as energy, transport, education, environment, and also manufacturing. Within this team, we've taken the opportunity to take advantage of Professor Burns' expertise and ask him to prevent, uh, present some of his thoughts into potential future developments. Um, some background on Professor Byrne, for those of you who don't know. Uh, Professor Byrne started out as an apprentice structural draftsman and has worked in DSB, um, Donnelly Mers, CIE, DIT, the IWF Technical University in Berlin, Daimler Benz and University College Dublin. During these times, Professor Byrne graduated from DIT and TCD in 1975 achieved a Master's in Engineering in uh, TCD in 1983 and uh, received his Doctor Engineer from the TU Berlin in 1989. And he has received honorary doctors, doctorates from DIT and Tijan University in the People's Republic of China. He has received many awards. Highlights would be the Fellowship of, uh, fellowship of the International Academy of Production Engineering, the CIRP, an award of the Gold Ring of the German Institute for uh, Engineers, German Institute of Engineers, for outstanding contribution to manufacturing science, which has only been awarded to one other Irishman, Charles Parsons, he of the steam turbine. President of this institution, uh, Engineers Ireland, from 2000 to 2001, and also president of the Irish Academy of Engineering. He's also a recipient of the Taylor Medal from the Society of Mechanical Engineers in America in 2010. Uh, Professor Byrne has also founded the Research Centre for Advanced Manufacturing Science in UCD and has been involved with setting up collaborations between numerous professional bodies, colleges and universities. He is currently a member of the Manufacturing Development Forum under the Minister, um, Mr. Richard Bruton. In the area of education, he's used his term as President of Engineers Ireland to promote engineering as a career and has extensive experience in running research projects and supervising postgraduates. He's currently advisor to the President of the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany and is serving on the boards of Open Hydro and Anna Engineering, I think it is. He's traveled extensively, meeting with professional bodies, researchers, and universities worldwide, and is therefore in an excellent position to comment on the seismic changes that are occurring in the field of manufacturing. And so I ask Professor Byrne to deliver his presentation. Yeah, so thank you very much, Paul, for, for that, uh, for that uh, great introduction. Uh, the, uh, good evening uh, to you. I'm delighted to be here and to have been invited to speak tonight. Uh, it seemed like a great idea a few months ago when, when Paul asked me, uh, and it's still a good idea. Um, the title is The Gathering Storm, uh, and it's to do with R&D and innovation in advanced sustainable manufacturing uh, to 2020 in Ireland. 
Uh, so it's a title that's uh, maybe interesting. You might wonder wh what's behind it. Uh, just to say in advance that these are my own opinions that I express here, so they're not those of necessarily of UCD or Farmer or, or any other organisation that I'm referring to. Uh, and then the slides are also on each uh, each um, on each slide. The slide numbers on the bottom there. You'll see it. So if you have any, any questions, you could refer to that slide number. Uh, I didn't realise that the the, the webcast that the, that. There couldn't be questions coming from there. Okay, so this slide here uh, is maybe just to start us off. Um, <coughs> we look at it. Uh, it's an interesting one that was shown recently. I'll mention it later on. Uh, but uh, are there impediments in the Irish system in relation to the development of advanced manufacturing to 2020? Uh, that question, the man with the red flag, uh, technology developed uh, and the technology capability being there but being hindered by the man walking along uh, with the red flag. So the, the question that I'm putting out there is, uh, are, are there impediments? And I'm saying yes in advance that there are impediments. And I would hope that this uh, will open up a discussion uh, and a very, very important discussion and debate uh, on what those impediments are and how we're going to resolve them. Very, very important because the, uh, the country badly needs uh, manufacturing, uh, as we're hearing. The title The Gathering Storm is not original. It doesn't come from me at all. It comes from the, ori the original one that at least I've seen is Winston Churchill after the Second World War in 1948 wrote a book uh, referring to the, uh, to the Second World War uh, uh, chapter, uh, volume one, uh, which he entitled The Gathering Storm. So he was looking backwards in, in, at, uh, at Second World War. In this case here, I'm looking at a gathering storm but looking forwards. And then there's a question, as well, you might have, is there a gathering storm? And if, if so, uh, what's the category of the gathering storm? Uh, and uh, so that's the thesis tonight, let's say, to, to look at and consider that question of the gathering storm. What's behind this, <coughs> for a, a big driver as far as in Europe, uh, one thing that really concerns me uh, a lot uh, is this question of the uh, unemployment and the youth unemployment in particular. And uh, if, this, if this data is accurate, then uh, <coughs> we see that uh, it's very uh, deep concerns in certain countries within Europe. Uh, and uh, Ireland is in there as well, and it's, so it's a very serious uh, issue of maybe the colour schemes doesn't, don't, don't come out that well on the slide, I don't know, but uh, Ireland is in that category of 30 to 40 percent is what's shown here. Uh, maybe it's improving, but still it's in the wrong position for us, and um, there's, if you look on this map, interestingly you see uh, where the, the bluish colours uh, show uh, where there's strong, a strong manufacturing base that is uh, relatively low uh, youth unemployment, this is youth unemployment. Uh, so interesting there, if the manufacturing base is strong, then the potential for youth employment it looks uh, good as well. So uh, this is one reason why we have to be there. But it's a deep concern, I think, that we would have in the country, not just in the country, but it's a, it's a driver for Europe. Uh, and I know that in Brussels, uh, th this is the sort of thinking that that's happening there. I won't dwell on this slide here because uh, uh, Paul has already mentioned most of it. Uh, but just to say um, what I do believe <coughs> Uh, looking at that, at that uh, uh, the national framework of qualifications, what's very, very uh, central in Ireland is the question of the trades, the craftsperson, the technician, and that whole ladder uh, system which, uh, which I personally have as well climbed up. Uh, and the, the, in Ireland, the culture of understanding precision, appreciating uh, precision, uh, and, and I think that in the terms of in the hand, the accuracy that the hand can achieve on the machine, uh, the, the accuracy within the eye, uh, and then the accuracy within the mind. So this, uh, this, <coughs> this would be one of my personal matters that uh, the real appreciation of that is, is very, very important. And I don't think we've done that well, in fact, in Ireland on the crafts uh, side uh, in, the last, uh, you know, in the last decade or more. Uh, and we are recovering, uh, but we haven't done that well. And we have to recognize that it's fundamental is uh, that appreciation of the, the, the skills capability, essentially, that, that's what I'm saying there. Uh, my own career path has also been nicely outlined, so I won't uh, dwell on that, <coughs> but uh, just to say a few things. Uh, I did work in the Technical University in Berlin, and uh, at that time I was involved with, uh, with the Farmhof organization, uh, and I'll talk a bit more about that, but that's uh, a joint project that I had, Farmhof with TU, with Daimler-Benz, led me into Daimler-Benz, so I worked for quite a while, uh, before I actually formally joined the company uh, in projects uh, that brought me in. So it was a very nice, smooth tr transition from 
being a, a, you know, a, a doctorate student to getting your doctorate to working postdoctorate with Brown Rover and then feeding into the company. Uh, in that case, the company set up a new division for, uh, for manufacturing and the environment, uh, and that's what I was working on there. Before I came to Dublin, uh, uh, 21 years ago actually, where I headed up mechanical engineering, and uh, I had five years as dean and then three years as college principal. The bottom there uh, shows some other involvements that I've had with. Uh, Open Hydro, Anum is a very interesting company and uh, I currently have involvements with Farm Rover from the Irish base. I've just set up a, a small company called GV Innovation Limited uh, that I won't have time to talk about tonight, but that's, uh, that's an interest as well for me. Uh, so just on, uh, I was thinking of two projects that I'm involved with and the Open Hydro one uh, was probably touched on at the last lecture here in the division uh, and uh, I am a former director there. We, the company was sold last year to uh, the DCNS, the French submarine manufacturer. Uh, I'm chairman of the R&D board of the company still. I've been involved since employee number three, uh, which is about 10 years ago. Uh, it's about 140 people now. Um, so it's a, it's a technical engineering project that's absolutely fascinating uh, and it still fascinates me today, mainly because the basic principles of mechanical engineering uh, where I assume an electrical, rota electrical rotating machine uh, and the, uh, the air gap, as we call it, in, in those machines uh, has to be absolutely precise. So normally you need a, a shaft, a good set of plumber block bearings, uh, the stuff that we learned that was really good, and this machine doesn't have that. And my initial assessment of that machine was that this ain't going to work. How could it work? Uh, so that was, so I've, I've, uh, I suppose I've been converted from, from that opinion to, to a different opinion today. It's a very important technology for Ireland. But lovely to see that in, uh, in this country, not too far from here, in County Loud actually, uh, and I was involved in selecting the site for Open Hydro, uh, that we can build something like that. That's, uh, I think it's, it's, you know, it, sh it shows the capability that we have uh, and Irish engineers designing and, and uh, making here. Another company that I more recently have become involved with is uh, called Anum, uh, and this company Anum is involved in uh, the area of the Internet of Things, uh, in SMS, uh, the text messaging, in secure text messaging, uh, and I can see a big convergence between electronic software and mechanical engineering, and uh, this company, I think, is a very strong engineering team in there, and it also has a very strong leadership team, uh, so we have enormous potential to build a very strong company here uh, in Ireland around the Internet of Things that I'll talk about. So uh, a big part of my career has been looking uh, at uh, involved in networks, and I'm a great believer as well since going to Berlin uh, in the networks and the importance of networks. In fact, it's a great competence, I think, that the Irish, sorry, that the Irish have is in networking. They're really strong in that particularly when we get on the airplane and get out there, then we seem to just transform into be really excellent. Well, they're probably good in Ireland, but uh, when we go abroad, we really excel. So it's a great attribute that we have. Irish networks, uh, hugely important, particularly for companies networking with one another. I think that's a future, very important aspect. Uh, and then also on the international scale, through academies like Academies of Engineering, uh, through uh, CIRP, through Farnover, and through other international networks. These are the ones that, that I have been involved with. The Irish Academy of Engineering produced a report last October uh, on the, uh, sorry, uh, October 2013 uh, on the future of manufacturing in Ireland. Uh, so the Irish Academy of Engineering is a very active body in this space as well. So let me mention Farnover <coughs> because you, you see it running through uh, my own career there, and Farnover is the largest applied research centre in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and they're very strong in the world. You see these are centers around, uh, uh, around different parts of the world. There's nine centers in the US uh, and uh, very heavily oriented in Germany and then in fact the 66 centers in, or 67 centers in Germany uh, and uh, so they're applied research. But what they've achieved there is very important for us is that the interface between the company and the university, that interface is not for uh, non-professionals, it's for the professionals. Uh, so they've professionalized that interface in a very, very significant way. Uh, in Ireland, we haven't got there yet in that. Uh, and so the farm over, in my opinion, is a very good uh, 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 example of how that, that can be done. Ireland is very different, so you can't do it in the same way, but, uh, but it's a very good example of, of how it can be done. So uh, I'm still very actively involved with Farm Rover. In fact, that helps me a lot to get the international perspective uh, also on manufacturing. SERP uh, is another organisation that's not that well known in Ireland, but it's a very significant uh, organisation internationally in manufacturing. 
manufacturing research, both academic and industry. Uh, and there's a very nice animation that Peter put together for me here. So this goes around the circle. Uh, so uh, that's nice and a very evening. Uh, so it, it, it takes us uh, around the world, and that's exactly what, what happens here, uh, that academics are exchanging all of the time in very senior organizations in the US, like MIT and Berkeley and so on, uh, and then also in senior industry. So it's a fantastic international network uh, for us in advanced manufacturing research. Very, very important. So uh, I suppose with that background and setting that scene, uh, I'd like to just move on now and talk a little bit about an international perspective on advanced manufacturing. So Ireland, small, uh, Ireland, open economy, uh, Ireland very strong in, in certain areas, uh, but also probably very vulnerable. And I think that's what we need to think about, uh, you know, that we are, uh, you know, we're, the position that we're in, we need to be watching very carefully what's happening on the international scale, the international level. So uh, in that sense, this slide here, I think, is interesting just to reflect for a minute and see uh, where things are internationally with the different countries in, in manufacturing. I'm sorry, the slide is a little bit out of date, but China has moved up since into the number one position, uh, and uh, Germany has slipped. Uh, I find interesting that Italy is where, where it's at. That's, that's something that's, a, that's very interesting. Uh, but the, U, the UK has slipped as well there, uh, and France, I think, has slipped. Uh, so Europe has slipped relative. Uh, and uh, so there is within the EU, and I'm involved in discussions within in Brussels in this question of how do we strengthen manufacturing uh, in, uh, in the EU, given this scenario here. And there are very, very deep challenges in advanced manufacturing uh, internationally. There's a complete changing of the global dynamics. Uh, I would say in all of the years that I've been involved, I've never seen, in the last three years, I've never seen so much change and dynamic uh, in manufacturing as we've had in the last couple of years. It's just a absolutely exploded. It's been quite amazing. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and the investments that we're looking at going into manufacturing uh, all over the world, uh, every country doing str strategic plans for, for manufacturing and so on. So um, we do have to be very careful how we look at this, uh, how we see it. Uh, and there are tremendous opportunities, uh, I think, if we look at it the right way and invest uh, appropriately. So I'm just going to take you for a little trip around the world for a few minutes uh, and uh, look at uh, you know, some of the things that are happening uh, from the perspective, an international perspective, just all the time looking back into Ireland and see, see how it relates to us as in innovation, in technology, and in uh, manufacturing. So um, first of all, the United Kingdom, very important for us, our next door neighbor. Uh, what sort of things are happening there? Uh, well, uh, there's so-called catapult centers uh, happening in, in, the, uh, in the UK more recently. Uh, they're bridging this gap uh, between the businesses and the uh, world-class research communities. Uh, the UK, it's fair to say, has slipped quite a bit in manufacturing in the decades uh, and is in recovery mode, is investing very heavily. And in the case of manufacturing, uh, there are, I think, seven catapult centers, uh, and there's money flowing in there uh, in the uh, hundreds of millions uh, into investment into R&D in manufacturing, uh, and there is a high-value manufacturing catapult there, as, as indicated here. There, uh, very recently, uh, just uh, in November, uh, a Herman report reviewed the catapults. Uh, I was involved in, in the meetings there, uh, and uh, they've decided that the uh, uh, exchequer should invest more and more into manufacturing. So it's only the early stages of investment really into manufacturing research uh, in the UK. Very important for us because uh, when we're investing in manufacturing research in Ireland, first of all, we have to have budgets and we have to have significant enough budgets, but they should be tailored uh, recognizing what our neighbors can, can do as well. Uh, so these are the seven centres that have been established uh, in uh, manufacturing uh, uh, in, in the, the UK. You see them in different areas, in different regions of the UK, and also in slightly different areas of so forming in Strathclyde and so on. I won't go into the detail there, but so this, uh, I was in the one recently in Coventry, the bottom left there. It's a phenomenal centre. The investment in there and the achievement uh, and the machines and the capability uh, is absolutely astonishing. It's, uh, there's nothing like it that I've seen anywhere in this country. Well, the closest to it might be the Tyndall, actually. Uh, but uh, yeah, I suppose the Tyndall would be uh, something like it. But the machine and the, the machines and the investment and the capability there is absolutely stunning. 
uh, not something that one would have expected in the UK even three or four years ago. Uh, and the other centres are indicating. Also, uh, the EU uh, is looking at manufacturing uh, in, in, uh, <coughs> from a longer term perspective, uh, is investing in these so-called KICS, uh, Knowledge Innovation Communities. There's one coming down the line in 2016. And it's absolutely, uh, just after losing my connection to the stream, <coughs> Sorry, no problem. Um, we should be back on. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the knowledge innovation communities, uh, I was just going to say it is so important that we're in, involved in this knowledge innovation community in the uh, uh, value added manufacturing when it comes down in 2016. We are doing preparatory work. Enterprise Ireland is, is supporting that very strongly, uh, and we are in there in the discussions. But the teams are forming now. Uh, there's already been many meetings this year, uh, and the team will be formed before the announcement in, in 2016. So uh, Ireland and the UK, including the Catapults, uh, should be and will be involved there. Uh, but it, it is a challenge for us. Uh, just let me then move on from the, the UK and into Germany. So uh, Germany will be an area that I'll be quite familiar with. The Mittelstand, I believe, is the backbone of German industry. These are the, the very large uh, SMEs. Uh, just to go back to that point about the craftsperson, I don't think I can make it strongly enough that, in my opinion, uh, the infrastructure in Germany, the key part of it is the craftsperson, the master craftsman, and I believe that that's the real backbone of the success of the German economy. Uh, what has happened in Germany, the German high-tech strategy 2013, uh, very interesting, very, very senior people in the German system from the Academies of Engineering, or the Academy of Engineering and Science, and also senior industrialists from the big, uh, very big, well-reputable companies uh, such as Daimler, Benz, uh, Mercedes, or Siemens uh, come together, and they decide uh, to call what's happening at the moment the fourth industrial revolution. That's not done lightly from a German uh, perspective, but they did it. Uh, and so what uh, they've come up with recommendations for what they call Industry 4.0. Just let me uh, show you this slide here, because I think it's, again, very, very interesting and very important for us. Uh, so the first industrial revolution is mechanization. The second is electrification. The third is uh, the use of electronics and IT. And then the fourth is this industrial revolution based on cyber physical systems. I think we can see that happening today. Uh, and that's the next phase, that's the next wave, uh, and uh, that's where investment is taking place uh, around the world. And uh, the Germans have stated that clearly that this is the, the fourth industrial revolution. What's very important for us on that slide, actually, uh, is that the complexity is increasing. Uh, now, it's not, there's no scale on it, but there is a huge increase in the complexity of manufacturing systems uh, as we move towards this uh, next, uh, next development of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, I'm summarizing that as being the, the, I, the three eyes. One is inst instrumental systems, the second is uh, intelligent systems, and the third is the interconnected system. So it's a different system to what we have today. The, the face of manufacturing will look very different by 2020 taking this here into account. So we cannot afford to stay put where we are. The, 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 the field is moving so rapidly, uh, we're just not going to be competitive if, if we don't move uh, and don't observe these sort of trends that are happening here. The addressing of complexity uh, is one where uh, I do think there are some opportunities. Anywhere where there's deep, uh, deep challenges, uh, uh, then there's also opportunities. And I think there's opportunities for us uh, in this space, for example, in the machine-to-machine -machine communication, the machine-to-machine -machine development, uh, the talking of machines to one another efficiently, uh, and very, very importantly, in a secure manner with, uh, with uh, data security. Uh, so uh, there's, there's great opportunities for us in, in, in companies in Ireland to develop here. But we have to watch it, uh, and we have to technology monitor. We need to monitor the, the technology uh, and then decide in a very uh, in a smart way, what, uh, what involvement that we might have in our companies in Ireland, both the SMEs and the multinationals. So uh, this is from the, one of the senior directors of C Siemens here telling us that uh, manufacturing 
is changing. Uh, it, there's an increase in competitiveness uh, and there's increases in efficiency, there's a shortening of the time to market uh, and there's enhanced flexibility. These are words that we probably have been hearing for a long time uh, but they are uh, absolutely true and it's, uh, the, the rate of change is, is increasing. Uh, the, uh, the, there's a nice term there, the non-linear uh, di digital thread. So there's a non-linear digital thread running through this here. So digitalization uh, and uh, this, uh, the area of software uh, and the, the area of data, data analysis, uh, comes back into the intelligence system. So that's, that's running through, but it's a non-linear uh, and that needs to be taken into account. Uh, so a major change in Germany. This, I, I, as I'm biased on the German system, but uh, I do think that there's a fantastic network, a fantastic infrastructure, a fantastic ecosystem uh, in Germany uh, coming from the university side uh, in through Leibniz Institute, through, through Farmover Institute, through industry research associations, and then through industrial research in, in companies. And I suppose I personally have been involved in the companies one in the Farmover and in the German university. So I can see that that merged with the crops uh, side of things, that there's a really strong uh, network infrastructure ecosystem built since the beginning of the 1900s. So the university that I worked in, the institute was set up in 1904 by a Professor Slazinger who was into machine tool alignments and interchangeability and limits and fits. So that's how far back it goes. So there's a great history in behind all of that as well. Something that we can learn from. Uh, the USA, moving on to that one. Um, <coughs> the USA, very different picture. Uh, deep concerns about manufacturing. Um, the uh, Obama policy now in place actually on onshoring and heavy investment in manufacturing research. So um, what are the implications of what's happening in the US for us uh, in Ireland? And there are implications, and these need to be carefully analysed. Uh, so uh, again, uh, make, make me very clear that uh, the title of my talk is not original. Uh, uh, to some extent, I've taken this from the thinking in, in the US, the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Sciences uh, prepared reports for the government, for the president, uh, on uh, entitled rising, um, rising above the gathering storm, uh, energizing and uh, uh, employing America for a brighter economic future in 2007. Interestingly, they came back in 2010, only three years later, uh, and they said, um, what we did in 2007, uh, it, it was very relevant, but we're now hitting a different scenario here, guys. Uh, we're uh, rapidly approaching a very serious situation in, in the US, and we need to do something about it. So they, it, I think that's in behind all of the policy statements and all the policy documents. This is the one that has caused the Obama government to react in the, in the way it's reacted. So what's in there is very, very important for us as well to recognize that. Uh, so I'm not original in, in the gathering storm, that's, that's not my thinking, uh, but it's coming through that, that sort of thinking there. Uh, and uh, there, there, it is well worthwhile looking into that. And uh, if you do look in, you see some recommendations like uh, the talent pool keeps, keeps coming up, uh, the, uh, the national tradition uh, to long-term basic research, how important that is. Uh, how strong are we in Ireland in basic research in engineering and in manufacturing? Uh, the recommendation to make the United States the most attractive setting in which to study and perform research, uh, and then for uh, ensure that the United States is the premier place in the world to innovate. Uh, so there are some very clear recommendations, uh, and not just that, but they follow through and are delivering on those now. Uh, more recently, this uh, last month or in October, uh, <coughs> the uh, Advanced Manufacturing Group, the Council of Advisors, uh, they prepared a report for, uh, for the President and uh, accelerating U.S. advanced manufacturing. So the pace of change in the U.S. and the pace of investment uh, is increasing, uh, although I know Obama has its challenges uh, where he's sitting, uh, but uh, there is an intention to strengthen the base of manufacturing, so there will be big investments in the future going forward. A nice study, a nice book to read actually is this one, Making in America, from a professor in MIT, Suzanne Berger, uh, and uh, that was based on a, a piece of work, a major uh, industrial survey uh, in different countries, including China and Germany uh, and in the US, and uh, the results of uh, what the future holds for manufacturing uh, making in America. So a very different uh, situation there now over what it was two or three years ago. Just let me move on to China, uh, and I believe China is not that well understood in Europe, actually. Um, I'm not sure that I understand it myself, <coughs> but uh, it's, very, uh, it's a very, very interesting country. Uh, 
I put a statement there, this is my opinion, it's not, uh, it's not anybody else's opinion, uh, but maybe, but it's my own one, that the Cultural Revolution, which is not that long ago for many of us, it was um, 1967, I think, it, it finished, um, and uh, that set China back enormously. Uh, I've been in China a lot, uh, and uh, I've looked at the academic work in manufacturing research, uh, and uh, you know, in the 60s and in the 70s, uh, what was happening in manufacturing research in China was excellent, really excellent, in, uh, you know, in uh, manufacturing process development. So there's, there's a fantastic foundation work has happened in China that many of us don't uh, see, we don't uh, know about. It wasn't published internationally, uh, but it is there and it's in textbooks, so there's a very strong infrastructure in there. But the Cultural Revolution set things back, uh, and uh, so that's, uh, I think we'd be in a very different position today if, had we not had the, uh, the Cultural Revolution. So uh, in, uh, in China, very, very aggressive policies. Uh, I mean, more aggressive than I think we, most of us can imagine. Uh, boosting productivity, uh, refining product development approaches, uh, supply chain complexity, uh, investing in innovation, uh, and reinventing made in China to designed in China and made in China, not just, uh, not just made in China uh, to the highest uh, of quality. So China uh, are investing uh, really, really strongly in, uh, in advanced manufacturing. The signal here is this one, <coughs> uh, the, over the past number of years, uh, China has risen to become the largest machinery, this is in mechanical engineering, machinery manufacturer. Uh, so it surpassed, uh, you know, if you look at the slope of those curves there, you can see the, the growth in machinery uh, manufacturing. So we're all aware of this, but I think we do need to, to look at it uh, and analyze it from uh, our perspective here. And in behind it, there are no doubt opportunities. Um, the Chinese Academy of Engineering, uh, our own academy here, works uh, with the Chinese or collaborates with the Chinese Academy of Engineering. That has opened up a gate for me to become involved with the academy. And the, the Chinese Academy uh, has uh, submitted uh, studies into the, go into the government. Uh, there's a new study at the moment uh, on uh, China manufacturing 2025, and I'm in, in a group that's looking at that, uh, and also then looking at our future into the 2035 scenario. Uh, the uh, other, other studies strengthening industrial fundamentals is also interesting. So materials for manufacturing, fundamental components, uh, fundamental manufacturing technologies, and then the standards aspect for, for manufacturing. So a very, very strong teams working there to, to build and, and strengthen manufacturing. This slide here um, is one that I find very interesting coming from the academic side as well. Uh, first engineering degrees uh, in the world are in some of the bigger countries, uh, and you see the way China has accelerated off in, in number of terms. Uh, so just the slope of that curve is, is for most of us, uh, quite astonishing. So the, the uh, change that's been happening in China in the higher education sector, in engineering schools, unprecedented. We've never seen anything like that before, uh, the investment going in there. And it's not too far away that many of the universities will be saying, uh, we want to get high quality education for our engineers, so we, we stay in China. We don't go to other places because we have very high quality education in China. That's not too far away, so it's very different. The, ne the coming years will look very different without doubt in engineering, and it sets challenges for us in academia uh, in Ireland. So in summary, and I would like to take a lot more time to go around the world and talk about manufacturing, but just in summary, mature infrastructure in Germany, uh, there's new challenges with the smart uh, with the machine-to-machine, -machine, with the interconnectivity, with the cyber-physical system, uh, there's new challenges there. Uh, the U.S., uh, as I mentioned, uh, the near-shoring and the off-shoring of the past uh, coming to an end. Uh, and uh, also, I, I do believe, from our perspective, could influence foreign direct investment uh, decisions uh, in the United States. And then China, the complete surge in manufacturing uh, and, uh, of course, huge challenges in China as well, internally in, in the country, no doubt about that. Uh, but in Ireland, as a result of what's happening internationally, there are phenomenal challenges for us in Ireland in, in manufacturing. Uh, so, <coughs> let me take you back into Ireland now uh, to, to start to, well, I'm not concluding yet, but, uh, but to consider the issues uh, and the challenges now. So how do I see the situation in Ireland coming back in? What are the key issues? What are the challenges for us here in, in Ireland? Uh, a lot of work has been done. Uh, there's uh, plenty of reports. Uh, I don't think we need to write any more reports. Uh, so I've been involved with one of them, but uh, well, with, with, with each of them there, in fact. But uh, uh, we have plenty of reports, plenty of analysis, uh, but we do need to get to 
uh, implementation of, uh, first of all, having clear policy and then getting to the implementation of the policy. I think that's the important thing. I don't think there's much time to waste. We, we shouldn't be thinking in terms of years, but we need to be thinking very short term to making important decisions for us in, uh, in manufacturing. <laughs> this is a slide here, <coughs> uh, just to signal that uh, the trends, uh, in this case here, it's to do with uh, capability, process capability, uh, and uh, we can see that we're moved down now uh, well, we can't see it actually, but we are moved down into the nano space of, of manufacturing. So we have nano manufacturing, we have ultra precision, precision, uh, and then normal. This in the case of machining. Uh, so there's tremendously strong capability uh, in manufacturing processes. That's very important. That slide. Why? Because I think the products that we we will be producing in the future have to be uh, very high quality, very high value add. Uh, you know, research intensive type project. So we need this type of technology and we need to understand this type of technology uh, if we're to implement it uh, in the industrial setting here uh, in the country. Uh, that scale, by the way, on the y-axis is logarithmic. Uh, so uh, it's linear in a logarithmic scale. Uh, I don't know what that means on a Friday evening, but it's, uh, uh, what it really <laughs> means is that it's a serious development that has happened there to bring it down into that tolerance uh, capability. Uh, another point here is that this is actually from a slide that Eamon O'Hearn prepared uh, for lectures uh, and to, to our students, uh, and uh, it's a quite a nice one. It shows you the inputs, the outputs, and so on. Uh, and I just uh, there's another box there, the energy footprint and the embodied energy, uh, and that's something I just like to highlight that uh, in terms of competitiveness. Uh, I do think that Ireland, in the particular circumstances that we find ourselves also with renewable energies, that there is an opportunity. The future, uh, the energy footprint on products will be very important in the future. Uh, and so if we can, uh, if, we're, if we're looking at competitiveness and if we can produce components to relatively low embodied energy, uh, then we can be highly competitive. So there is an opportunity uh, in there in that question of the energy footprint, given the relatively high renewable energy percentage that we would have in Ireland on the grid. So the vision that uh, I suppose I'm expressing here is that very high value add, uh, research intensive components, uh, subsystems and systems having low embodied energy through zero defect, lean and clean advanced manufacturing. Sorry, there's an awful lot of words in there now, uh, but uh, that's, a, that's a vision I think, if I was to summarize in, in a sentence, uh, what do we want to achieve? I think. For me, at least, it says that, and I'd like to hear the debate uh, uh, around that as well. That's a vision that we have. If we have that vision, uh, and we, if we buy into it, then we have a lot to do, because uh, to achieve that, uh, given what I mentioned about what's happening globally, uh, there is significant change and significant development needed to achieve it. Uh, so uh, let me just come back a little bit to the cyber physical uh, system side, because that is where a, a, a major part of the future will reside. Uh, I mentioned the interconnectivity. Uh, I mentioned the opportunities for companies that are involved um, in this question of how to interconnect uh, in a reliable manner. Uh, and then also this whole question of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the way we do our business in engineering will change as a result of this. So in the cloud, uh, a lot more data uh, and then our interaction with that data in a different sort of way. Uh, and uh, then back down into the machines, and the machines being distributed. So I suppose, uh, you know, this uh, a machine for manu manufacturing a, a spare part for your car, if you're, if you're driving in Galway uh, and your home is in Galway, then you may have that machine very close to you to manufacture the spare part. So very different to uh, some of the standard things that we, we all kind of grew up with, uh, very, very different uh, uh, ecosystem and structure uh, around manufacturing. So the traditional factory will look very different, I suppose that's uh, what I'm saying. Next section, what will impede Irish manufacturing into the future? Uh, and this is, the, this is getting right to the core of my presentation, and <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite challenging to put that out there, uh, but I do think that we have to face it. We have to ask ourselves, what, what is impeding uh, and what will impede into the future? Uh, if we recognize that, then we can do something uh, to ensure that, uh, we, that it will not impede uh, our development. Uh, so this one here uh, is a slide from that uh, uh, manufacturing report uh, of last year. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, there were targets set, uh, a base year of 2011, and uh, again, Peter did a lovely job putting this little dot moving there. So where, uh, what, we, what we had in that report was the green line, the lower one, uh, is the one if we do nothing. The second one is the middle line, uh, where if we take some action, 
uh, and then the top one is where we feel we need to get back to. Uh, and uh, it, uh, you know that setting is uh, kind of nearly as a minimum of where we need to get to. Uh, and uh, so how are we doing? Actually, we're not doing too badly. Uh, we're somewhere touching above the, the middle line uh, with some, you know, so there's, uh, there's been good development in the last two years. Uh, there are some good signs as well, uh, but we're not there, and we have a long distance and a lot of hard work to do to get ourselves up to uh, where, we, uh, where we want to get to, which is this level here uh, of, uh, I think at the time, baseline uh, 2011, we said we want to have 42,000 more jobs uh, projected by 2020, so that's the challenge. In behind that is the availability of the skilled worker. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, do we have the people? Uh, do we have the availability of skilled, skilled workers? And we have to ensure that we do uh, have them. Uh, this is, would be one topic that the Manufacturing Development Forum, which met the day before yesterday, uh, one topic that would be on our agenda. <coughs> Just very recently, within the last two weeks, the president of uh, University College Dublin gave his inaugural address. Uh, and actually, again, I seem to be taking things from other people because I took his picture as well, uh, and uh, he had that red flag picture. Uh, just look at that sentence. It will take courage for Irish political leaders to trust and empower university leaders to build and develop our universities to keep pace with the best in the world. Uh, so um, that's what the president of our university, of University College Dublin, said the other night. Uh, and, uh, you know, just that's a very important statement. Uh, to keep pace with the best in the world. And that's just keeping pace. We should be thinking even a bit more than that. We should be leading. Uh, so um, there is, uh, you know, within our system, uh, as I said, this is one reason why I'm saying there are impediments in, in the system. Okay, let me give you an example. <coughs> not Probably not that well publicized and maybe not that well known, but to somebody like myself who's been a college principal for a few years, uh, leading engineering in UCD, uh, then uh, this is the situation that we have uh, currently, that the so-called, and I won't go into the definitions now, but for supporting students coming into the university, the block grant has reduced by a factor of two, or more than two actually, so the, 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 uh, um, uh, the funding coming into universities has reduced seriously. Uh, I'm just not clicking on here, actually. Maybe. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so we've gone down the down the curve here, <laughs> uh, and uh, so the the uh, amount of funding has reduced. Look into that carefully because it is very serious, uh, and those of us who are in the uh, higher education sector know how serious it is. It is having a big impact. It's particularly serious for laboratory-based disciplines, like engineering, like science. Uh, the funding for engineering and science, uh, where there's uh, you know, sig significant laboratory activity, uh, is a very, very critical issue. If we're to be delivering engineers uh, and scientists that are world-class, we can't have that situation continue. So uh, for me, that's a very, very fundamental impediment that we have in the system. And uh, I have spoken this to senior people uh, within government about that, uh, but we have to keep that message, I think, there. It is a very critical uh, position that we have. Another, uh, in terms of manufacturing, just staying with this, uh, this is published information that uh, very recently, uh, first call in Horizon 2020. Uh, in that first call, there were uh, five Irish-led projects, 25 participant projects, and none of the projects were funded. So we had a zero success uh, in that first call in Horizon 2020. Now, what is the reason for that? What's the problem? Uh, and uh, there are challenges there for us. As we're saying in Ireland, we need to uh, really capitalise and really get funding out of Horizon 2020. And that's the first result in manufacturing. It's indicative of some <coughs> systemic problem that we have in our system, having that situation. Zero projects funded. Uh, this is only very recently now. So uh, in t uh, uh, that's one aspect. Another aspect uh, that I think is very important for us uh, is the question of materials. We're quite well equipped, actually, in Ireland in research in the functional materials. But there's another category of materials called structural materials. Uh, and the structural materials, uh, for example, the metallurgy side of uh, things, uh, there is a lack of expertise and research initiatives uh, in that space uh, in Ireland. We have precious few metallurgists in Ireland now, and in academia, hardly any at all. And yet, it's such a fundamental area for us uh, in, in the country for the products uh, that we're wanting to make and, and needing to make. That's, a, uh, that, that's an issue. Uh, so, 
again, this is kind of a boring statement coming from me, but I do think we're behind the curve in this question of additive manufacturing in academia in Ireland. Uh, it's very, there's not a good situation that our industries, our SMEs, they have to go abroad to find in-depth expertise uh, in additive manufacturing. Uh, there's been a lot of development in additive manufacturing. Uh, I'm quite familiar with, uh, you know, over the last 20 years, what's been happening. Uh, you know, some leading centres like this one here in Aachen uh, that have many PhDs in additive manufacturing. You know, uh, we're well in excess of 30, perhaps, or uh, I've got the number, but very large numbers. So there's been fundamental research going on in additive manufacturing for, for decades, uh, and it's just hitting our shores now. And we're not at all equipped for that, actually. We're not equipped for it. Uh, and so that's a challenge uh, that we have. We need to be equipped. Um, there's great opportunities in additive manufacturing, absolutely no doubt, uh, but we're coming from behind. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's a challenge for us. But I, I, I don't want to be sound too, I don't want to sound too negative because I do think we can still, in certain areas on the uh, roadmap, the technology roadmap there, we can also uh, do certain things that will be a benefit to us and will help our industries. So there is a background of 30 years in laser development for stereo lithography, for example. The first patents were in the mid 80s. Um, so that's a little bit on the negative side. Uh, I don't want to finish on, 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 on being too negative, but uh, there are positive developments for Irish manufacturing as well. One of them is this prioritization exercise that we had uh, and where uh, 14 priority areas, maybe too many in the country actually. 14 is a lot in Ireland. Could we not have had a smaller one? But, uh, processing technologies and novel materials uh, and manufacturing competitiveness is in there. So that's a very positive given the international trends that are happening. That's very good. Uh, there's a lot of centres uh, in technology centres and some of them relate to manufacturing. This slide here signals some of them, uh, composites uh, and so on. Uh, there's an ICMO, it's the Irish Centre for Manufacturing Research, a technology centre, uh, and uh, that's very positive that we have a technology centre. Uh, and then some of the other centres feed in. Manufacturing is complex, I suppose. It's not a straightforward, singular discipline. So some of the other centres would feed into manufacturing. Are we well equipped to manufacturing? We have 12 SFI centres now, just very recently, uh, the last number funded. Uh, these are the ones here. Uh, and so again, there's a very, very good infrastructure in Ireland for uh, the basic research coming into universities. But basic uh, also very strongly linked to industry. So that's a good development, I think, uh, coming out of uh, Science Foundation Ireland. And some of these, although not in a, not in a particularly focused way, some of these uh, centres are working also uh, associated with manufacturing. I would like to see it stronger in manufacturing, uh, but some of them are involved there. And so uh, this slide here, I think, is, is interesting to look at. I think you let it grow on you and you see all of the centres, uh, the Irish Technology Centres. And when you look at that, you see that there is a lot of investment. Uh, there's really good work going on from Enterprise Ireland, <coughs> really good work going on uh, through the IDA as well, uh, and uh, a lot of very, very positive developments there. If you're an SME, however, sitting in Galway, and you're looking at that picture, uh, and uh, you're busy, uh, and you're doing quite well, but you want to link in with some centres, how do you navigate that? Uh, and that, uh, I think, a comment would be, it is very complex, it's confusing, difficult to na navigate. Uh, who's the right contact person? What are the mechanisms for engagement? So I think uh, the next phase of development of that has to be uh, to achieve, to answer some of those questions, you know, to uh, ensure that companies can benefit to the maximum uh, from uh, what's available there as a, an infrastructure. And let me say, some of the work going on in those centres, uh, like the Crest, for example, uh, there's really good work going on with companies, with small SMEs as well as middle-sized SMEs. Uh, so there's, there's really good uh, facility infrastructure in the country. But I don't think it's yet together. It's not, uh, it's not integrated yet in the way that I would like to see it. Good example as well in manufacturing, this one in the Limerick Institute of Technology, a new Bachelor of Engineering in uh, Precision Engineering at Level 7. Uh, and this is what I was talking about, the skills training. In this case here, it's very nice metrology. Uh, advanced uh, CNC work and so on materials. So a lovely program has been put in place there very recently uh, and a very good development and we need more of that in my opinion. <coughs> so uh, I'm coming to an end, I'm not sure Paul how many minutes I have. Uh, a few minutes. A few minutes? Uh, so I'm coming to an end. Uh, so what I decided to do here uh, was to put out uh, for the debate now to put out what I consider to be 10 recommendations 
uh, that I would uh, bring forward uh, for discussion. So uh, I've got 10 recommendations, but you might say, well, why did he not include that and so on? So it's a difficult challenge, but I decided rather than not do it, I'll put out 10 recommendations. And I really hope that we can have a good debate uh, around these uh, recommendations. So uh, the first recommendation that I'm making uh, is <coughs> the question of the employment control framework in Ireland. I think what we have to do is we have to remove the cap on the headcount. That's just not working in Ireland, and it's a very, very serious problem. Uh, and uh, wh what does it mean? Uh, as I see it in engineering, uh, around the globe, the engineering is gaining uh, in popularity. It's building, it's increasing in numbers. Uh, in the US, that's happening, uh, well, basically all over the world. Uh, we're gaining in numbers uh, in certain cases in, in our colleges, uh, but we can't appoint in staff. Uh, so our student staff ratios are going, going the wrong way. Uh, our ability to do research uh, is uh, affected by that. Uh, so it is a very, very fundamental problem that we have in the country, and that cap just has to lift. We can't continue. We're just not competitive <coughs> if we don't. Uh, really address that. So whatever we can do, uh, and uh, I would hope that the Division in Engineers Ireland uh, and Engineers Ireland as well can achieve something in this. We need to force that issue. It's just uh, a big problem for us. Uh, I did mention the block grant, so you might say, well, he's coming from the university, so he would, but it, it is very important, uh, and uh, you know, particularly the laboratory-based disciplines. In the 21 years that I've been in UCD, um, there's been precious little investment in equipment for laboratories. Uh, so uh, the equipment coming in through research funding perhaps, but directly in for undergraduate program uh, into, uh, into UCD has been very, very little. Very difficult for maintenance and also technician support. So there is uh, that question as well. How good are we really in our laboratory work in, uh, in engineering in Ireland? Really how good are we? Are, are our students getting a better experience than what they used to get? <coughs> Um, well, I think there are questions that, that we need to answer, but I have deep concerns about that aspect as well. Um, item number three, building a critical mass of academics in advanced manufacturing. Uh, this is something that uh, we haven't done. Uh, we have a serious shortage of academics in, in advanced manufacturing. Uh, we have had the problem in Ireland that manufacturing hasn't been attractive so we haven't been able to attract students into the courses. Uh, so the academic staff then haven't been uh, attached either. So, uh, so there is uh, uh, certain, certain reasons for that, but I do think that we need to build that, uh, build the academic capability in Ireland in advanced manufacturing. That basically means getting, getting good academic staff. I would say I've never experienced anything like the number of professorships in manufacturing engineering around the world as has happened in the last couple of years. I, I'm just, personally, I'm inundated with requests to sit on boards for, I can't do it anymore, to sit on boards for uh, appointments around the world. You know, virtually, there's, there's so many of them now, uh, and we're behind the curve in that question of the academics, which is a fundamental support into the industry. So uh, again, that's my number three. Uh, the offerings uh, from the research centres, to well, I mentioned that, that slide there, that we need to simplify the offerings. There are very good offerings there. There's really good equipment in the universities and in the institutes of technologies, in the research centres, uh, that uh, the uh, industries don't know about this. So we need to simplify that in uh, whatever uh, way we can do it. Uh, we need to develop better networks and university industry partnerships. Uh, so uh, how do I feel about the university industry partnerships in Ireland? I think it's not well developed yet. We need to do more. Uh, we're not there. Uh, there's, re there's great will in certain ways, but it's hit and miss. Uh, I use that word professionalised uh, through the farm offer. I think we do need to professionalise this activity, however we do it, uh, but we need to have some systems in place to improve that. Uh, I think industry looking at universities uh, sees uh, universities to be difficult because they're not able to operate in the time frame that the industry needs. Uh, and uh, then the university looking to industry, challenging because the university has uh, key performance indicators uh, that, uh, that doesn't fit with the, uh, with the industry. Uh, so the, uh, there, there, is, uh, there are issues at that interface that we just have to go and uh, address. 
that be. Uh, further development of the skills needed to meet the future advanced manufacturing requirements. This is terribly broad. There's a full report on it, but, uh, but maybe we could be specific uh, and take examples like we saw, uh, I showed you for the Limerick case, uh, and look at that and include also the supply chain because the manufacturing change that's happening, this, what I was talking about, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, it's a paradigm shift. Uh, and, you know, some traditional things like supply chains, they look very different in the future. So we need the skills and the people uh, you know, understanding that and being able to, to apply them in this new uh, scenario. Uh, the structural materials research, I mentioned that as well. Uh, we absolutely need to do something about metallurgy. Uh, you know, out of the manufacturing in, in the powder metallurgy side, if you look at what expertise is actually in Ireland in powder metallurgy, what have we built up? Uh, and uh, for me, at least, at the end of the day, added the manufacturing uh, great opportunities. We can take weight out, we can add functionality in, we can do internal things that we can't do uh, with uh, existing subtractive type technologies. Uh, so it's about, in my opinion, the microstructure of the material, the consistency of the microstructure. Can we get consistency uh, and can we really control that microstructure? And for gradient materials with varying properties, we can get great opportunities through the, through the, uh, the, ch the changing uh, of properties, but we need to understand what's going on there and we are not equipped. So that's for me, is if we're interested in developing uh, into the additive manufacturing space, that's very important. I shouldn't uh, omit the polymers because I think the polymers <coughs> equally, uh, it's, it's, it's quite different, but I think uh, polymers has to be included as well in, in, a, in a process capability that we have. Strengthening our base in automation, in robotics, and in machine tools. Uh, we don't have a significant machine tool company or uh, industry in Ireland. Uh, our automation is uh, limited, uh, and our robotics is, in the, is limited, and our universities and institutes of technology have limited uh, capability in, in that space. And yet, you know, we want to improve our productivity levels. We have to improve our productivity levels. Uh, and if we want to improve productivity levels, how do we do it? It's true automation. We have to get the uh, higher levels of automation. Machine tools are, are not to be underestimated. They're very, very complex. I mentioned Jörg Schlesinger in 1904 setting up an institute in Berlin. They've been working on machine tools since that time there. The thermal behavior of machine tool is complex. The dynamic behavior is complex. Uh, the uh, additive manufacturing machines that have been built up to very recently, in fact, uh, haven't really had the machine to <coughs> depth of technology uh, in there, so they need that now because we will be looking at higher positional accuracies of machines, uh, higher capabilities, influences of thermal behaviour and so on. Uh, so we need to strengthen our base, we need to have that debate uh, around the machines and the automation. Um, <coughs> the development of uh, additive manufacturing, so you see that's kind of running through my talk actually, uh, and 3D printing, uh, that's an interesting area I think for us, as a small nation uh, if we are aware of the roadmaps, uh, and uh, you know, several generations of roadmaps have already happened. Uh, if, we're, if we climb in there, uh, we look at them, then there are clearly uh, opportunities in there for us, uh, but we need to do that. So uh, we don't have, a, as far as I'm aware, we don't have an Irish technology roadmap. There's roadmaps for additive manufacturing, but not an Irish one, uh, so we need that. And then the last recommendation is to facilitate a coordinated approach to policy development in advanced manufacturing. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm on the Manufacturing Development Forum, so that's one forum. Uh, but having gone through the reports with the Irish Academy of Engineering and looked at that, uh, Michael, we've had several, lots of discussions on it, uh, but I would like to see a much better coordinated and structured approach to policy development here. Uh, so. It's, at the moment, for me, it seems to be a little bit hit and miss, so we need to coordinate it, structure it, recognise that we need to move quickly, uh, and uh, then uh, implement as quickly as we can. So we need, uh, that is not in place in the country at, at the moment. It is in place in, uh, in other countries that, that I'm familiar with and I've had some involvement with. That's it, that's the 10 recommendations. I'll put that out there for, for discussion. Before I do, um, <coughs> to the question, I think there are impediments. The Irish ecosystem is small, it's agile. We've got tremendous attributes, not least our networking capabilities, uh, technical capabilities as well. The uh, Irish uh, scientists, the Irish engineers uh, prove, uh, have proven ourselves beyond doubt uh, uh, internationally. Uh, and so 
the answer that I'm putting out there is yes, we can make it. There's a little a double meaning there. Uh, if we plan well and uh, if we invest appropriately, but we have to do that. Uh, and we have to get rid of that guy with the red flag, basically. Uh, that's what, how we do it. Just to finish off, <laughs> Uh, this, this one here, I'd like to talk for a moment about the STEPS program because that's very, uh, as, uh, I've been kind of following that STEPS program uh, since before I became president of Engineers Ireland. Uh, it's v not to be underestimated, it's really an important program. Uh, it's the, uh, you know, the financing for that I know over the years uh, has been challenged uh, and it maybe continues to be challenged, but don't let that happen. We really need to support that. It's hugely important for the skills development and for the creation, the, 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 uh, the, the formation of our, of particularly of our engineers in Ireland. Uh, I have a thing about gender balance in engineering, but that still needs a lot of work uh, and the STEPS program is uh, relatively is very well positioned to do that. So keep steps in front of our minds. We need to support that uh, as best as we possibly can. This young man here, um, I think Eamon O'Hearn, if anyone's here will recognise the machine perhaps. It's a, it's a five axis or multi axis trophy mat uh, prototyping grinding centre. Uh, it has a cooling pressure of 120 bar. It's got a linear speed of 230 metres per second. Uh, now, that's a serious amount of speed for, uh, for a grinding machine. Uh, it's got a 5G five, five accelerations, so or the acceleration of the table is a 5G. Phenomenal machine, uh, but we do need to, uh, you know, these the sort of skills that we need, and we need to be watching them. Uh, so, this is Liam, my grandson. <laughs> uh, he's working that machine, so uh, interesting. So, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'll just leave that slide there uh, for the purposes of the discussion uh, and the summary recommendations that I've given in this talk here tonight. So, thank you very much. Um, just, uh, if anybody has any questions, um, if you can just wait, uh, we have two people circulating the room for uh, microphones, so if you just indicate by putting up your hand, we'll uh, get you a microphone so we can uh, have people on side. Uh, Professor Deborah Lefer. Um, Professor Deborah Lefer from UCD and I guess co-founder of U3D, our new 3D printing center. Um, oh, yeah. Jay, if you had five million euros, what would be your top priority? If I had five million euros. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really, really difficult question. Now, I'm not, I haven't even anticipated it coming, so uh, it's not often I think that I, I can't make a stab at it. But uh, if, you, if you have five million, first of all, I suppose I would ask the question, uh, you know, we have the ICMO, the Irish Centre for Manufacturing Research, really good centre, very good people in there. It's not getting enough money, actually. Uh, it's just recently been refunded. But you know, when you look at the UK and look at other places, it's getting a relatively small amount of money. So I think I would probably kick off by saying, uh, A, do something to support the SMEs, uh, and then do something to support the manufacturing research. So I would probably go in that direction of uh, the ICMO with it. But I'm probably excluding a whole lot of other important agendas as well, but uh, anyway, that's <laughs> okay. Hi, Jerry. Paul Kameen here from AIT. Good, good, great talk, Jerry. Thanks. Um, in terms of the polymer side, you mentioned a couple of times, just to let people know, I, I think I mentioned to you beforehand, Jerry, but uh, in AIT we brought back the undergrad for polymer, which is a good thing, I think. And thanks to Enterprise Ireland, we've got a new um, technology gateway centre in applied polymer technologies, which we do an awful lot of uh, good work, thanks to Enterprise Ireland, with SMEs. Um, in the centre, related to that centre, we've done over a thousand projects with over 270 companies in the last number of years, which is SMEs uh, and startups. So, um, so just that's a point there, I suppose. Um, on the on just another point, I suppose. Um, I thought about product design and manufacturing. I think if we just do the manufacturing on its own without uh, increasing capability in product design, then I think we're missing a trick. Um, so. Any thoughts maybe on, on the product design piece? Um, I know there's a year of design next year in, Ar in, for Ar in Ireland, and um, 
uh, there's a bit of an issue in the Midlands trying to see what could we do in the Midlands for, for that, but around the country is, is you know, there's maybe opportunity left for engineers in Ireland as well on, on product design and increasing the capabilities on product design. If we get the R&D part of that, then it'll help us keep the manufacturing piece. You know, if we, if we own the IP of the design, we can, we can decide where to manufacture. Yeah, um, can I just say a few words already? Uh, in my mind, Paul, uh, design and manufacturing are inextricably linked. They're completely, you know, they just completely flow. They're, they're almost one. Uh, so, uh, you know, to separate them out uh, is wrong. Uh, and uh, maybe in the past we tended to think that we design here, we manufacture somewhere else. I don't think that's the way that we, we should be thinking. Uh, but that we would have, uh, have the design capability here as well. Uh, in that regard, then, we need to uh, look at uh, are, we, uh, are we strong enough in our design activities? Are we, are we uh, you know, developing the young people with design capabilities? Maybe our universities and uh, our third level sector, uh, you know, there's been a trend. We have a, we have a certain dilemma uh, that we want to be top international universities. So our key performance indicators are publications and so on, and these are all very important. We want to be top, uh, so we have to have those. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's easier for a department like in, in UCD to appoint somebody who uh, has gone through a master's, a PhD, uh, postdoc, and then uh, into academia than to appoint somebody who's been in industry. So engineering, I think, might be suffering a little in that sense that uh, if somebody comes in from industry and they don't have that list of publications, it impacts on the international uh, you know, standing. Uh, so there's a certain di dilemma that, that we have. So uh, I, I do think that we absolutely need to have practitioners uh, in our training programs and our educational programs who've got experience of, of design. Uh, and, and then, as I said, I wouldn't at all, in my mind, at least separate our design from, from manufacturing, keep the two of them uh, closely together. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, so uh, Gareth O'Donnell from Trinity College in Dublin. Maybe related to that point, um, and I think for me it kind of um, opens a little bit of a challenge when we immediately go and link actually design and manufacture. So they are inextricably linked, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But what we're talking about, and maybe what I picked up from your presentation, Jerry, and from what we know of your history, that we're talking about the detailed, focused engineering science that underpins manufacturing is, is a pillar of work. It's, it's where effort and resources are required. If we, and th we don't have that. We don't have the resources that allow us to do the fundamental engineering science that underpins manufacturing. And if we put, that, if we put ourselves head to head with our German colleagues or our French colleagues, or our UK colleagues, I think that we, you know, we're exposed there. Our companies now that are trying to move further into R&D and process, um, as opposed to product innovation, but in process innovation, they, they're starved of talent in that regard. So I think it's, I agree that the design and manufacture at the high level and the superficial level, it's okay to say that they're linked, but that we also need to recognize that there is a, there is a massive pillar underneath both of those camps if we say we support design for manufacture, we blend it, then we take away from the idea that there's a, there's a deep um, focus required for engineering science underpinning manufacturing technologies. So yeah, that's just a, a comment. That's a, that's a really good word of caution, I think, there, Gareth. So I've said there, uh, you know, I think um, the understanding of manufacturing science, uh, if, you, if you take a process out there, whichever process it be, uh, laser cutting or whatever, uh, very quickly, we can we could sit down together, Gareth, and we could identify a hundred variables. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a uh, hundred variables in that process. We do need to have very tight process control capabilities, so we need to have a good understanding of those. We're not interested in running in a black art scenario. So there is a science of manufacturing. Right, that's right. That that is that, that's absolutely the case, uh, and uh, that's not well enough understood, I would say, 
uh, in Ireland, probably not in the UK as well as it should be either. So we're not alone in this. Uh, so I, I think I, I can agree. Well, I hope I'm not being, uh, uh, maybe am I giving a conflicting message? I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting that design for manufacturing is not important. Uh, I hope you're not suggesting that either, but the other one is also extremely important, yeah. Uh, Jerry, uh, Matt Cottrell, say, uh, Cork Institute of Technology. Uh, yeah, I think you alluded to it there, Jerry. And just to come back to your points one and two, really, I mean, the, you know, the universities ourselves in the Institute of Technology have been, you know, been running on 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 on, on, on empty really for quite a while now in terms of a certain equipment. But an important point too in relation to the employment control framework is not just the the cap on uh, headcount. There's also a cap on recruitment salaries. So it makes it extremely difficult, I think you mentioned there, to attract people in from industry and to have this movement of people from industry back into academia who bring that e practitioner experience with them. So mm. I think that's been there for longer than the, even the present uh, crisis. So I think, you know, maybe you'd like to comment further on that. Yeah, uh, well, I think other than saying yes, I mean, the, the initial link uh, that I, I considered in this talk was the headcount. Uh, but, but making it attractive and, you know, uh, at the moment we're constrained in appointing people in under contract and, uh, you know, there's a, so it's very extremely difficult to attract good people uh, in uh, under those conditions. So I, I agree with you that uh, the salary is, is an element of it as well, uh, but even just, uh, you know, getting the people, getting the headcount, that, that's one. Yeah, so, uh, uh, Matt, I would say there's a whole complex in, in around that space, yeah. Um, Jerry, thanks for an excellent paper. I'm going to give you more than five million. I'm going to give you a magic wand. So <laughs> the 10 points have been fulfilled. But um, assuming they have, as I understand it today, no firm exists, well, will exist anymore where they will do the whole job. So we're going to have people, skilled people in a whole lot of uh, different areas but we'll be supplying to maybe 100 or 50 different um, outlets. So what kind of firms do you see and how do you see the skilled people that we will produce? And I, I still am a great um, believer in the type of education that you favor, the German system. How do you see them being absorbed? I mean, we're talking about an extra, I don't know, 40,000. Uh, you know, uh, is there a master plan or do we just keep on producing them or do we see that there's some kind of a, a system whereby they will be absorbed or will they be for export? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, well uh, yeah, I mean, the, the targets have been set. They don't look like they're unreasonable targets, I'd say. Uh, so uh, that, that, that's what, what, what we're working towards and we want those jobs prime in Ireland, you know. These are not jobs for, for abroad. Uh, so if we want to have those jobs, then we have to have the skill set in behind it. Uh, and uh, I do, I think I'm clear in my mind that the traditional engineer that we've been educating, uh, you know, is, has limited capability in, in the sense of what's required going into this new, into this new world. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm personally challenged because uh, the philosophy that, uh, as I said, precision in the hand, precision in the eye and precision in the mind. Uh, you have to have people with that, you know, very, very strong uh, capability. Uh, and uh, so I like very much the idea of solid, a solid foundation. So for me, thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, good material science, a really strong foundation will be needed. But then we need also additional uh, things. And some of the additional things that we've heard in accreditations uh, over the years uh, have been there, but now on top of that, there are further additional things. So we would have heard, for example, we need uh, ethics, uh, absolutely, we need languages. Uh, but now we're moving into another phase of development where, uh, where we have this, uh, I suppose, cloud-based activity, and then there's another set of skills in there. Uh, so I think it's a challenge for the educationalists uh, to, de to, to, to define uh, what an engineer uh, really should, what skill set should an engineer have in their training and then coming coming into industry. Uh, having said that, Brian, I do think that, I hope I wasn't being too negative there under this gathering storm theme, uh, but I do think for, for us in Ireland, there are really good opportunities in this new business model. There are new 
the paradigm shift uh, in, intrinsically means there are new business models uh, coming at us, and in there there are uh, there are opportunities for. I suppose you know maybe Germany is uh, central there in, in Europe, uh, but it's not about centrality anymore. It's not about centrality. You know, distributed places in different parts of the world uh, can be uh, very very important contributors. Uh, so uh, Ireland and uh, you know remote parts of Ireland indeed. Uh, can be a very um, um, uh, significant contributor. Uh, so I, I think, and if one doesn't answer your question, but uh, it's uh, because of that whole paradigm shift, uh, the skill set that's, that's needed uh, will be different. So I, I would be suggesting we need uh, in, in the company as well to be discussing that, what should the skill set be for these, uh, you know, the next generation of, of scientists and engineers uh, coming out. I haven't really hit the answer the question fully yet. Okay. Uh, Una Parsons, uh, Head of Mechanical Engineering in uh, IT Sligo. Uh, Jerry, thanks for an excellent stimulating talk. I'm very interested in your thoughts on the future of apprenticeship and how that can satisfy what you're talking here. And especially now that we've got the new Apprenticeship Council launched, and I know you're an advocate of the German model, so do you see uh, new types of apprenticeships in manufacturing and, you know, uh, metrology or different areas? Any thoughts on that? I, I'm not particularly well equipped to, to talk about it, other than maybe some my own personal experience. But uh, when I was going through the educational system uh, at that time in Dalton Street, uh, I had the luxury of being uh, in an environment which had apprentices, uh, young apprentices, early stage apprentices, more mature apprentices, uh, the technician certificate, the technician diploma, and then right through into the, the engineering. Uh, that was a superb uh, environment. Uh, for a whole lot of reasons, not least the facilities and, and the equipment, uh, and not least the staff and the staff uh, competency that was being uh, that, that 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 we were exposed to. Uh, so uh, I think that, uh, maybe uh, I mentioned there, Luna, about the apprenticeships situation having deteriorated. Uh, I think it did deteriorate, uh, and uh, you know that's a terrible pity because there was a good infrastructure uh, in the uh, in the in the different institutions. Uh, in the past, we lost it, and, and now we need to, to regain it. Uh, so, uh, I, I, my own view is that uh, not to underestimate uh, what a craft really means. And a craft for me uh, is not doing a course for six months or nine months or a year, and then then seeing that that's complete. It's a long, it, you know, there was wisdom uh, in the cabinet maker taking seven years. There was wisdom in the electrician taking five years. And uh, that wisdom, uh, the, the environment has gone more complex. Uh, so, uh, you know, they need time. Uh, it's, it, it's a diffusion process of learning as well. They need to understand the materials, uh, the, the various aspects of the skill. So I don't know enough about the new scheme, but uh, if it's shortening apprenticeships down uh, to a significant extent, uh, and if it's not then giving these skills of, so I suppose a young person <coughs> needs time to absorb uh, and really understand the behaviour of things and why, uh, you know, ask the question why, not what, uh, and some level of understanding of that. That's what, that, that's what they need. So I would hope that our new uh, system for uh, apprentice, which I would really welcome, I think is a hugely important development in the, in the country, uh, but I would hope that it will deliver that apprentices of very high quality. I personally believe, <coughs> and I know I'm biased, but I do think organisations like Siemens, like the ESP, like CIE, uh, they made an outstanding contribution to the crafts network in Ireland in the past. Uh, and so whatever comes in now has to replace that. So that, that, that really, as I was a, bit, a little bit broad in my answer, but that's, that's my view on it, yeah. yeah. Um, Jerry, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a retired uh, um, operations manager with Google Ireland. Um, thank you very, very much for a very interesting um, uh, paper. It's also very frightening from an Irish point of view. Because as I see it, we're probably at the um, at the at the third stage of, of um, industrial industrial revolution, and to get to the fourth is quite a seismic shift, or quite a paradigm shift, as you put it yourself. Um, it seems to me there's going to be an awful lot of uh, of uh, investment needed in um, manufacturing equipment. Have you um, have you any idea what that cost might be? Because to get from where we are to where you seem to want to be at the kind of cyber physical uh, systems uh, end, of the, end of the scale seems to me to be a, a very, very big jump. Now, I think, uh, I think the skills can be 
can be taught in universities and colleges of technology and so on. And the uh, the uh, the, um, the new course down in Limerick is very is very good in that in that area. But the cost of actually uh, tuning up to get to where you want to be would seem to be to be enormous. And where would the money come from for that? Yeah. Th thanks for the comment. Uh, so um, I did mention the importance of networks. Uh, Ireland is small. I don't think we can afford from our exchequer, certainly not at the moment, uh, to invest heavily into, let's say, capital equipment. The capex budgets won't be strong. Uh, so my view is that look at the best practice and then associate ourselves with best practice and don't try to uh, uh, repeat what the UK are doing in their seven manufacturing centres, what Crown Hope are doing in their 68 or 67 centres in Germany, but uh, identify where we believe we really need uh, the expertise. So on the roadmap for additive manufacturing, for example, the Deborah is involved with, uh, then identify where uh, our, uh, where we can uh, have a core which will be world leading and then invest around that, uh, but it will be limited. Uh, so so it, do, it does need, uh, I mean that machine that I showed my grandson, now, that's a very expensive 5G uh, acceleration machine, uh, that's just one example, but there, there's a lot of, as you're absolutely right Eamon, there's a lot of investment needed, but I don't think Ireland the, in, uh, the industrial ecosystem possibly doesn't need e either because we have a different industrial ecosystem. So I think we need to uh, make the very best use of the international networks. Do we do, we do that? I think uh, there are individuals, uh, all of us, many of us are traveling uh, and uh, you know, we're seeing things. Uh, there is an, uh, we all have our own sort of network, but I don't think we're particularly well coordinated and we don't exchange much about our networks. Uh, so, so my answer would be, we're never going to, you know, I agree with you, the, the exchequer will have great difficulty investing to, to, uh, to, you know, to ramp up in this area. I don't think we should do that. The other side of the coin is that machine that I showed you there, that will be probably out of date, uh, you know, within, uh, it won't be months, but it'll be certainly within years, you know. Uh, so equipment goes out of date. Uh, so we need to, we, we can't afford to invest in something that will be going out of date either. Uh, so that's what I would suggest. Uh, identify where we believe there'll be small, and, and I suppose the SFI have, the, have had that philosophy as well, where there's small niche areas where we really can be world class uh, and then uh, utilize our networks uh, to, to bring in uh, whatever else we need around that. Um, Paul Cowling at the back. Uh, hi, Jerry. Yeah, Paul Cowling from Isn't Up Right. Um, my, my, my question is probably on the same theme. Um, I spent 12 years now working in Ireland on engineering teams and Increasingly, I'm finding that we're designing and engineering products not for manufacturing in Ireland, but for manufacturing in the Far East. How would you suggest we try and persuade business owners that they should be investing in automation in Ireland rather than investing in engineering teams to produce, to design products for production elsewhere? Hmm. Yeah. Um, Can I make a yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, In one of the recent uh, reports that Jerry referred to, the President's Commission report for Obama, I think it was an earlier one than 2014, uh, America realized that um, by outsourcing their manufacture, their design fell down. So they're now trying to bring back their manufacture because they need that link between manufacturing, actually running a factory and making things to feed back into the actual design. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things that they're looking at, and they're looking at community colleges to uh, reskill people at that level to run the factories. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it's, it's not an easy question because the, I suppose at the end of the day, the economics and the cost comes into it, and the cost of manufacturing, as we know in China, is significantly lower, and the capability is increasing. Uh, so, uh, so how to how to square that? On the other hand, we see evidence in Europe <coughs> of companies taking their manufacturing back in. So we should ask them why is that? Uh, and the closeness of design to manufacturing, uh, it's kind of a, there's a loop system there, uh, and if it's a long distance away, then you don't close that loop. Uh, so you're not getting the continuous improvement in the product. Uh, so there's very good reasons why companies should manufacture here, uh, but it has to be competitive. 
So we need to search out for what are the, what are the competitive advantages that we might have in, in, in Ireland. Uh, and there are some. Uh, I mentioned, maybe we haven't had much of a debate on it, but the, I do believe the carbon footprint aspect comes in very strongly into it. Uh, and so if we can have our you know, embodied energy uh, in, the, in the components and the systems that we're manufacturing below, then we are competitive. So, so there are, there are, it's, not a, it's not a lost situation by any means, it's a challenging one, but it's not lost. I'm going to have to go to uh, the last question from Declan Noynes, the former chair of the division. Uh, hi, Jerry. Thank you very much for a really interesting talk and um, prompting um, loads of questions as we've heard this evening. I'm sure many, many more, so I feel privileged that I'm asking the last question. No pressure, like. Um, <laughs> I, I'm an enjoy, I'm, my job in Enterprise Ireland uh, involves me in the technology centres, technology gateways and most of the funding programmes that go into the, the third level institutes and um, I, I just going back to I think a couple of slides there where you put a few challenges up um, in well, the one about the four, t four countries and four challenges, um, you needn't go back to it. I think yeah, yeah. the challenges you, you Germany's challenge and China's challenge and, and then the Irish Ireland's challenge. To me, um, Germany's strength lies not just in it, the strength of its manufacturing base or the strength in its advanced manufacturing base or that it's high value advanced manufacturing base. It's that they have most, they have much more businesses that are in total control of the value chain uh, than we have in this country. Uh, and that allows them to be um, close to their market, close to the customer. So I suppose the question or, or observation for you to comment on is that, uh, to me, the biggest challenge that we face in this country, not diminishing the challenges that you presented here for investment in the support of uh, research infrastructure and uh, in the various technologies that we need, but the biggest challenge is how to create more of these industries in Ireland that we have managed to do to some extent over the last 20, 50 years, uh, but still not enough to drive the advanced manufacturing research centres that we would like to have, because w without those, those manufacturing centres um, have sustainability problems, as we have found over the last 20 years. Um, and, and that is the, so the technology centres and technology gateways that Enterprise Ireland funds, that's, that's the way we are funding them now, show us the industry base that will support them, and, and we will work hard to, to make them come to fruition. So um, I suppose the question is, what do we have to do to create not just the engineers of the future who are multidisciplinary and have um, fluent knowledge of internet of everything and technologies, but also are, are able to make that connection with, with the market that the Germans are so good at. Uh, the Germans make everything in the world except whiskey, as far as I can see. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the, uh, the question. It's, uh, it's a very challenging question. You know, it's a very broad uh, 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 question to try and put a, put a framework around for, for an answer. Uh, I've had some experiences myself. Uh, for example, I, I was director of a centre called the Product Design and Development Centre in UCD, funded through the International Fund for Ireland uh, in uh, the 90s, actually. Uh, and that centre was in additive manufacturing. It was in stereolithography, joint venture with Queen's University. Uh, and uh, the challenge that I faced there was that the funding ran out after two years, and that was it. Uh, so there wasn't additional funding. So it had to be, at the time, defined as being self-sustaining. Uh, is that the right model? No, it's not. Absolutely not. Uh, the model has to be uh, we invest in something, and then we stay with it. Uh, so the Brown over, for example, one of the fundamental policies is that they stay with it. They don't restrict it to three years or five years. They restrict it to <coughs> performance. 
So if the, if the performance, uh, the key performance indicators are not, are not going in the right direction, then it, it, will, uh, it will die out, as it were. Uh, but they will guarantee uh, funding provided the key performance indicators are met. I think we need to do that in Ireland. We need to have a situation where uh, it's just not appropriate, particularly with our ecosystem and, and small industries, uh, to, to uh, fund something for three years and expect it to have, uh, you know, to be self-sustaining after that. It doesn't work. We're not alone. The UK have similar, the US have similar. I've been involved with quite a lot of discussions around that. But I do think we need to, uh, you know, if we can identify what areas are really important for us and then invest in them, but stay with that investment. The other question around the German Mittelstand, uh, I agree with you, they, they've got, uh, they build up in families a different culture where they hold on to their SMEs. They don't, uh, they don't sell off to multinationals. Uh, uh, easily, and the families are very proud about their, their companies, uh, and so they build up a great bank reserve, uh, and so they can invest. Uh, so the mid stand, uh, and I think uh, there's some really interesting lectures going on, series of lectures in uh, in the Royal in the ODS uh, that uh, is addressing this sort of question around uh, the the comparator of the mid stand in Germany to the Irish situation. But actually, I really firmly believe that. Uh, the product design and development centre that I was involved with is a shining example where in the 90s Ireland had invested in uh, additive manufacturing and I was the director with uh, Eric Beatty at Queen's University, a lovely centre, stereo lithography equipment uh, and that just, uh, it just died out, you know. Had that not have happened, I don't want to go back into the past now, but had that not, not have happened, what I've said that we're behind the curve wouldn't have happened, we wouldn't be behind the curve. So that's just one example of where if we go, go in, invest, and stay with the investment. Uh, and so that's what, it, that, that's what comes to mind immediately, that came in here. Mm. Uh, so maybe there's a discussion needed uh, around that. It's a, it would be a fundamental policy change if we were to not just have a three-year funding, but a, a longer. I, I think five years has become the norm, but that's still not enough in my view, so I'm glad to hear you make that point. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, sorry. Uh, It's traditional at this point that we ask uh, for a vote of thanks, and Mr. Tom Kelly, um, Divisional Manager Engineering, I think in uh, Enterprise Ireland, has kindly offered. Thank you, Tom. I, I, I stand up here because it's, it's easier to face an audience rather than talk with my back to it. And um, so thank you, Paul. You're welcome. And it is indeed my privilege, it's my honour, to actually be able to propose a vote of thanks to you, Mr. Bird, tonight. I have to say that um, I actually knew of Jerry Byrne before I ever met him. It was the late Seamus Timoney who I first heard talking about the quote, if I can remember accurately, and I probably can't, I certainly can't, but he talked about this fellow in Germany. And the fact that there was somebody, some Irish engineer out there leading the way, prominent in that kind of academic and industrial circle in Germany. And it was one of these things that I look forward to, to eventually meet, sorry, probably, I don't know, many, many decades ago, <laughs> you begin to count your life in decades when you reach a certain age. I wasn't disappointed, and, not, and particularly so in terms of the relationship that I've been able to build up with Jerry over the years, working in Enterprise Ireland, in Farbert, in Olis, in the I I IRS. It was, I think, around the end of the IRS all this year when you came back into Ireland, Jerry. The man who actually brought a knowledge, not just of the world and the science that really underpins engineering, but actually a knowledge of its application in the most advanced industry of the time. I remember reading papers that you authored, particularly in the area of surface engineering, that continued to enlighten and certainly helped my understanding as I worked in that particular field for a number of years myself. So tonight we have heard a lecture which again does not disappoint because it shows the incisiveness of the mind that is in Professor Byrne and indeed the privilege that for anybody who has gone through and been your student would have actually have had the benefit of. I think it was a very telling lecture and I think something that I have taken quite a few notes and that's perhaps kind of, you know, a long time since I was in the lecture theatre <laughs> taking the notes from the professor. And I remember a former professor of mine saying, 
good morning, and he s then stopped and he said, the good students will have taken down good morning. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't a good student. <laughs> but he, you touched on many different things, and I do think it is really worth reflecting and reflecting again on some of the points that you were bringing out. <coughs> I think one of the critical things, I think, for me, and I suppose the, maybe the most significant slide for me among the many very interesting slides, was that one that actually captured the way, the direction, the demand that actually there is there in terms of the science as we move to higher and higher levels of precision, as we actually get to the stage, you know, where there's a logarithmic scale that actually traces the actual, in relatively short periods of time, the demands that is there in terms of the, both in terms of the formation or the cutting, and indeed in terms of the metrology it's needed to measure. I think that actually sets out the challenge, I think, in terms of the direction uh, that has to be achieved. Recently, I was in Germany looking at a number of these Mittelstand companies with a group of Irish companies. And the one really strong takeaway for me was one, the absolute centrality of engineering in their thinking. And that was manifest in terms of the importance they attached to skills. Right in the heart of several of the factories that we visited, a small group of us, was the training center. This was where both the engineers and the apprentices were working side by side, acquiring the levels of skills necessary to work in those companies. This was centered on in the factory floor, in the very center of the floor, walled off with glass partitions where everybody could see it, a statement of the value that they attached to training and skills in that company. I think there has been an ongoing challenge in terms of attracting people in from industry into academia and vice versa. We know that is a challenge that has been around, not for this year or last year or the year before, but for decades. We do not seem to have adequately bridged that. And yet I think it is so central. And that is one of the reasons, in fact, why I found Jerry Byrne over decades one of the most interesting and most important people to consult with. Because his experience wasn't simply one drawn from research, drawn from the teaching and the reading of books and, the, uh, and, uh, and, and so on, but actually founded very much on having worked with industrial companies, and particularly with advanced industrial companies. I think we do need to address that. We do need to do it, and we need to do it quickly. And we, d we know it needs to be done. We haven't done it. Why not? Declan Lyons, my colleague and very good friend, has been responsible for bringing a lot of order into the what is kind of that research infrastructure that has been built and been building over a number of years now. In fact, actually, if you look at it, we actually have, I don't know, 40 or more, 50 perhaps centres in one form or the other that would be titled research centres. And there is really a challenge of accessibility here. <coughs> I think that has to be recognised. But there are some, at least some improvements that are there. For example, this week, Stephen Cardinal, who's here from the Department of Jobs Enterprise, would have been responsible for publishing a new directory. I think that's a very, very important book that should be on everybody's desk, whether you work in the world of industry or in the world of academia. It's the first place to go looking for where the access is. But the importance of the gateways in particular, I think, is something that we shouldn't underestimate. The gateways that actually provide an immediate line of access. You don't have to know everything or everybody in the system. The idea of the gateway is actually to provide somebody who will actually have that, the knowledge to know where to direct the company into the academic research system. And that's something I think that we need to continue to build on. And we need to forge an alliance between there all of those centers of relevance. And I would see it, if I can try to visualize it like this, that we should see it very much like a system of planets orbiting the sun that there's actually significant capability in the many research centers. And at the very heart of it, from where I come from, from the position I would adopt, the sun is the industry. Because in terms of ultimate justification, it is actually the people who work 
the large numbers of people who work in those industries that actually ultimately, if you like, justifies the type of investments that have to be made, that have been made in the actual research community that actually has been built up now over the numbers of years. But that system of planets must work as a system, not in actually going on their own merry ways. I'm going on at length. <laughs> this is a matter of great passion for me, all of this development. But it is a privilege to be able to stand here tonight to propose that vote of thanks, because it is one that is deserved. We have been honoured by your lecture, but I think we recognise the eminence, the preeminence that you actually hold in this world of manufacturing. You have been somebody who has brought enlightenment. I think you have challenged us tonight. And on behalf of all of you, I would like to propose this vote of thanks. Um, just uh, one last announcement um, in, in relation to what Jerry was, uh, has been talking about is our next event is in the 3rd of February, uh, which is Tuesday evening, and we're having an additive manufacturing 3D printing night. Um, Professor Deborah from UCD is going to be talking at it amongst uh, four speakers um, to look at this whole area of uh, 3D printing additive manufacturing. And it's to kind of look at how the kind of public engagement has been captured by this 3D printing revolution. Um, but we want to kind of bring a, a little bit more structure to it, look at the indri industry side of it, look at um, kind of the technology transfer from you know, the university sector into industry or how industry can inter interact with the university or <coughs> IT sector. Um, and also then to look at the, the future, which uh, Professor uh, is going to look at it for us. Um, apart from that, thank you all for coming. Um, keep an eye out for future events um, that we'll have over the next year. And those of you who are staying for dinner can make your way upstairs and we'll sit down and enjoy a meal. Thank you. Thank you.